Welcome, and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in the listen-only mode until the question and answer portion of today's conference. If you would like to ask a question today, please press star followed by the number one on your touchtone phone. You'll be prompted to record your first and last name. Today's conference is being recorded. If you should have any objection, you may disconnect at this time. Now I'd like to turn the call over to your host, Ms. Irene Ihear. Thank you, ma'am. You may begin. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to today's FDA webinar. I am Irene Ihear of CDRH's Office of Communication and Education. On February 3rd, 2016, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration issued the final version of the guidance document Applying Human Factors and Usability Engineering to Medical Devices. This guidance seeks to assist medical device developers in following appropriate human factors and usability engineering processes to maximize the likelihood that new medical devices will be safe and effective for the intended users, uses, and use environment. The focus of today's webinar is to review the recommendations on this guidance document for manufacturers, and other interested stakeholders. Your presenters will be members of the Human Factors team, Shannon Hosey, Dr. Hanami Wyor, and Dr. Shin Fung, all of the Office of Device Evaluation. Following the presentation, we will open the line for your questions related to topics in this guidance only. Additionally, there are other center matter, subject matter experts available to assist with the Q&A portion of our webinar. Now, I give you Shannon. Hello, everybody. It's uh, great to be here with you today and to talk through the final uh, release guidance, uh, Human Factors Guidance. And the other opportunity we wanted to have today, other than reviewing the guidance, is to introduce you all to the Human Factors team here at CDRH. And so that is myself, Shannon Hosty, uh, Dr. Shen Fung, who will be speaking a little bit later, and Dr. Hanabi Rior will be uh, wrapping up our discussion today. After we get a chance to walk through the guidance, we'll go over the, the basic tenets of the guidance, and then we'll be opening to the question and answer. So I look forward to that. So we'll get started. Um, first, we'll be going over the relevant regulations and standards that are applicable to human factors, and we'll be talking through the guidance. And finally, we'll uh, have some some conversation around the draft guidance that was issued at the same time on, on February 3rd of the highest priority devices for human factors review. So to get started, the regulatory basis for human factors. So for human factors, there's basic tenants within design controls, 21 CFR 82030. Design input is asking for the intended uses of the device, including the needs of the user and the patient. This can be identified and defined through human factors methods, and it's, it's fundamental to the development of the project. <clears throat> Excuse me, and then design verification and design validation. And one thing I would want to note here is design validation, to read the quote, is to ensure that the device conforms with the defined user needs and intended uses. One thing I want to make sure we point out here is we'll be talking about human factors validation. And human factors validation is looking to show that the user interface supports safe and effective use. And so that is, when you're looking at those definitions side by side, that is a subset of design validation. It is not, they're not synonymous per se, um, but human factors validation may answer some of your design validation needs. Make sure we're clear on that. Also in the preamble to CGMP, uh, you'll notice human factors is mentioned specifically. We identify that the manufacturer should conduct appropriate human factor study, analyses, and tests from the early stages of design process. So again, here is outlining that human factors it is a, a portion of product development that follows through the, the product development process. And also later in the preamble, it's identified that use error is considered to be a nonconformity. The idea here is that uh, this is emphasizing that human factors is part of uh, risk management, it's part of understanding how the device can perform uh, to a manner that is safe and effective for you. A quick overview of human factor standards and what's out there in the landscape right now. So AT75, uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, is, is a large uh, 
standard document that goes over, it's more of a design tool and standard. It goes over some human factors processes as well as specific elements of how human factors is, is, is important in control design and software design. But it also has chapters on specific applications such as mobile health uh, and home health care. So this is a great reference as you're conducting your human factors activities. Also recently released is uh, ANSI Amy 62366-1. This is an update to 62366. And what this document does is it focuses more on the safety aspects of usability engineering. Again, as we go through this discussion, the usability engineering term in this document and human factors engineering, which is the term we use in, in our guidance, uh, they're, they're more they're synonymous for the purposes of this discussion. This document will walk you through the usability engineering process. And an important thing to note on this, while this is a recognized consensus standard at the agency here, this is not a test standard per se. It's a, a horizontal standard. It, it identifies a process uh, to implement usability engineering. So as uh, we review submissions, when we see conformance to the standard, well, what we may ask for is the data behind that because conformance to the standard uh, doesn't indicate a pass-fail type result. It uh, indicates that the process is valid. Also, while not a usability standard, 14971, the risk management standard, is integral to everything we'll be discussing today and because usability engineering and risk management activities are interwoven throughout uh, product development and product life cycle. We, we arrive at our guidance document. So we have the final document was released on February uh, 3rd of this year. And as of April 3rd, it will supersede the 2000 version of uh, Human Factors Engineering and Risk Management. And then the draft also, which was issued in 2011. And I wanted to give you a quick overview of some of the changes from 2011. I know that's been out there and, and widely read. Um, so one thing we aim to do with this new uh, final guidance is to clarify the scope of when human factors is requested for a pre-market submission. And one important thing to note here is when we're discussing this, we're not discussing whether or not human factors work is pivotal to product development. I think we were clear on that back when we were looking at the design controls. Human factors is part of robust design controls. What we're discussing here and what the question on the table is, is whether, when, and whether or not human factors data should be submitted with a pre-market submission, okay? So the, the criteria we're looking at there that we aim to clarify with this guidance is that if a task of use could result in serious harm, so a use error could result in your serious harm, that's where we, we can say as we're looking to protect public health, we want to review human factors data. So some quick terms. We've added a definition section to this document. Some key terms that I wanted to touch on before we get going, because it'll come up in this session and it shows up throughout the guidance document, our critical task. And so this is a, a task, a user task, if performed incorrectly or not performed at all, would or could cause serious harm. Key, key word there is could. The idea here is we want to look at all of the critical tasks that could lead to serious harm. And then user interface. And when we say user interface, what we're referring to is all points of interaction between the user and the device or the product. And so that could be packaging, labeling, training, the, the graphical user interface, any controls. Um, if the device is portable, it could be the way that it's um, handled, or the handles on it, uh, all of those items uh, we're referring to when we're talking about user interface. So as we look at the guidance document, this is a graphic from that document, and this walks through the general flow of human factors engineering, and it also is the way that the document is laid out. So we'll be talking through this today. Quick overview of human factors engineering. Human factors is a systems engineering type discipline. 
whereas if you are looking at a device, you're looking at the system boundaries at that device. When you move that out and you're considering the users and um, other inter folks with interactions, uh, you move the boundaries out, you look at all of the interactions within those boundaries, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about human factors. So the key things that come into and can affect that device use are the used environment, uh, the user and the characteristics of the users, the device user interface. All of those items interact and can result in correct use or incorrect or unsafe use. And then if we break that down further, we want to look at, this is a, a basic model that I'm sure most are familiar with, of understanding the uh, mechanisms behind that interaction. So this is just the basic systems model. Coming into the user interface as an input of some sort, the device processes that information and it generates an output. This output could be information, it could be an energy. Then this information or energy is perceived or received by the user. Uh, they process that, they are recognizing it, they are understanding it, they may be making decisions, and then they're choosing to take an action on that. A few things I want to point out here is when you're looking at this diagram, when we talk about use error, use error would happen right here at this star. Use error happens when the person takes the action. And then that information goes into the system, the system generates an output, that is where the hazard can occur. That is the output of energy too high, too low. It could be an output of incorrect information. So, so when we're referring back to these and looking at even test data, uh, we, we're talking about use errors happening at this action point. We're talking about uh, that potential hazardous situations starting here at this output point. And then we can go back as we see those events and start to understand why they might have happened. So if we see a use error, we can start looking back and seeing if it was a, if it was a problem in perception. Was, was an item noticed? Was it, you know, visually perceived? The processing, was it understood? Could the correct decisions be made on it? And then finally the action. So we'll talk through a little bit here through hazard analysis. And the, the key thing here is as these preliminary analyses are going on, as, as you're starting to understand the product you're developing and understand what risks are there, is understanding what are the critical tasks of use and identifying those. Again, when, when looking at these critical tasks, they should be identified based on their severity of potential harm and not necessarily the probability. And, and the caveat here is because, first of all, it's very difficult to estimate probability of, of a use error or of an item that could lead to use error. Um, but also, at this point, you're trying to identify all the potential hazardous situations, so as you're going through that, you're looking at the things that could lead to harm. And tools to do this are typically bottom-up tools, so you're looking at failure modes and effect analysis. This is where you're walking through on a task level, what could go wrong at each task. This would be an FMEA or a FMECA. And then fault tree analyses is also another method uh, that's used for this. And also, as you're going through this, there's um, evaluations of known use problems that can lend insight into this. That can be your internal complaint files. It could be knowledge that your sales staff or training staff may have. It uh, could be information you have from previous human factor studies. Another good source are uh, databases such as the uh, uh, MAW database or MedSun here at the FDA. But there's also uh, industry sites. There's even YouTube sometimes has some interesting uh, information on how your device is being used. So there's lots of places to gather this data. Then in the evaluation, you want to start looking at analytical approaches to, to work through your user interface and understand uh, for all of the, the pieces of safe use. And so that could be through a task analysis or heuristic analysis, as well as an expert review. But then the next level, as you're starting to develop prototypes, is to go through contextual inquiry or interviews or formative evaluations, so cognitive walkthroughs or simulated use testing at some level there. And again, each of these are, are targeted at slightly different pieces of information, slightly different understanding of your user interface. So, so depending on what you're trying to discover at this point is, is the method that would be the best for you. So we tried to explain some different um, options here. And then we'll get into the next step of the process, which is then trying to implement mitigations and risk control measures uh, to reduce use there, reduce the 
potential high severity harm? So again, as with general risk management, the, the best thing to do is design modifications to remove the hazardous situation. So that would be inherent safety by design. The next step would be to consider uh, protective measures. So this is um, allowing a fault to happen, but um, not allowing it to lead to a hazardous situation. Um, and then the next level would be uh, information for safety. And again, as with the risk literature, these are listed in order of effectiveness, typically. And then as those, those updates are made, whether it's on the, the design of the product itself or whether it's in uh, additional information being provided to the users, these uh, should be evaluated to, to confirm that they are effective, the verification of effectiveness, and that uh, they don't introduce any new risks. So at this point, you've evaluated your user interface, you've started to identify your critical tasks that could lead to harm. Uh, you've started, you've mitigated some of those and you have some mitigations in place that need to be evaluated and you're ready to move on to validation testing. And at this point, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Fum, and he'll be talking you through the validation. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is Shin Fong from uh, Human Factors Team at BA. Um, so I will here talk about the Human Factors Validation Testing uh, in the guidance. Now, the goal of the Human Factors Validation Testing is to demonstrate that the user interface of the device can support uh, the intended use, uh, intended user, and intended use environment without causing serious harm to the user or patient. Uh, to achieve that goal, uh, the testing setup should match the representative intended user, intended use, intended user interface, and intended use environment. So more specifically speaking, uh, the test participant should represent the intended user of the subject device. Uh, all the critical tasks from your analysis should be included in the human factors validation testing. The device user interface uh, that includes the physical interface as well as training, packaging, and labeling material uh, should represent the final design and be used in your human factors validation testing. Uh, the test conditions of the validation testing should match the representative use environment of the subject device. So in the next few slides, we'll talk more details into the test setup uh, the data collection, as well as data analysis of your human factors validation testing. So first, uh, regarding the test participant, uh, as we mentioned, the test participant should match the intended user's population of the subject device. Uh, in general, uh, minimal 15 participants should be included for each user population. Now, the guidance gave uh, two examples of what is the single population. Uh, one example is between pediatric population and adult population. Uh, and the second one is the healthcare providers and lay users. Um, there are two examples from the guidance regarding the distinct population. Uh, to avoid the bias introduced in the testing, uh, your employees and partners should not uh, be served as the test participants as a general rule. Uh, and then the test participants uh, should be U.S. residents. Uh, we saw some exceptions in the past, and then uh, the exceptions to this rule should be considered on a case-by-case -case, um, basis. Uh, regarding the tasks and use scenarios, uh, you should present uh, the test participants with representative use scenarios. Uh, and you can uh, group the tasks into use scenarios in the logical order. And you should present the use scenarios to the test participants uh, following a natural flow. Uh, then prior to the human factors testing, uh, you should define the task field uh, criteria uh, for each critical task. Um, as mentioned before, 
you should identify the critical task based on the severity level uh, instead of the probability, and you should include all the critical tasks in your human factors testing. So next one regarding the uh, instructions for use and labeling material. Uh, as we mentioned, labeling and IFU is considered uh, as a part of user interface of the subject device. Um, all the labeling, uh, the IFU, and packaging, uh, when they are used in the human factors validation testing, they should represent the final design. Um, at, at the representative uh, scenario, uh, you are that uh, your users will make their choice to use the IFU. That means some users may use the IFU during the actual use. Uh, some users may choose not. Uh, so uh, the human factor validation testing uh, can include the IFU as part of the setup. Uh, however, the test participants should make their own choice uh, whether they use IFU during the testing or not. Um, and last, um, if you decide to um, use IFU uh, and change IFU uh, as part of the risk mitigation for the use-related issue identified by the human factors testing, uh, you need to provide follow-up testing data uh, to demonstrate that the IFU change will be effective uh, to reduce or eliminate uh, the use-related risks. Uh, as well as not to introduce any new uh, use-related issues. Regarding the participant training, um, again, the training uh, offered in the human factor validation testing should match the representative training. Um, between the training and the human factors performance testing, um, the guidance recommends minimum one-hour training delay um, similar as the labeling change, uh, if you intend to use training as risk mitigation measure, uh, you need to provide the follow-up testing data to demonstrate um, the effectiveness of that uh, risk mitigation measure. So now we're going to cover uh, the data collection part of the human factors validation testing. Um, there are two big categories, um, the objective data collection and subjective data collection. So for uh, the objective data collection, uh, first of all, uh, because you have uh, defined the performance criteria for each critical task, uh, you should be able to record the participant's performance uh, for all the critical use scenarios. Uh, so the typical data type includes success, U0, close call, uh, operational difficulty, as well as an anticipated U0. Now, for um, certain types of um, uh, use-related uh, tasks, uh, for example, the warnings, cautions, contraindications in the IFU, uh, which may be uh, difficult to quantify uh, and format in a uh, performance task. Now, for those type of tasks, uh, you can format them into knowledge questions, and you can collect uh, the participant's response to those questions and record them as knowledge task data. So the second big category of your data collection is uh, subjective data. Uh, and you can generally can collect the subjective data by uh, the interview. Uh, so there are a few things uh, or categories that you can collect by subjective questions. Uh, the first one is you should get participant feedback uh, upon the overall device use uh, and the each use scenario. Uh, you can also get participant assessment regarding uh, the participants' own thinking on what are the use-related issues um, that, including use error, difficulty, confusions, occurred during the human factors testing. Um, the last but not least, uh, you should get the participants' perspective on why uh, those use-related issues occurred during the human factors testing, 
and that will be used uh, for the root cause analysis for those use-related issues. So now you have um, the test completed. You collect the subjective data and the objective data. Um, very important is you use those data uh, for the analysis of your human factors testing results. Um, you, by looking at both objective data and subjective together, uh, it should help you to identify the potential use errors occurred during the testing, as well as to determine the root causes of those use-related issues. Um, you should be able to uh, look at each uh, use-related issue uh, through your risk management uh, methodology uh, and identify uh, whether risk mitigation measure is required. Now, if you determine additional risk mitigation measure is required for those uh, use-related issues identified by the testing, um, then you need to provide follow-up testing data uh, to demonstrate the effectiveness of those proposed risk mitigation measures. Um, so there are cases um, that um, the simulated use testing might not be sufficient. Uh, as an example, that uh, uh, for a um, certain type of home use dialysis system, that um, certain uh, human factors issue uh, can be only validated uh, in the actual use environment. Uh, so for that case, you need to consider uh, conduct the human factors testing in a actual use environment. Uh, most likely for that, uh, a um, ID study might be required. And you can consider to um, conduct the actual use human factors testing as a part of the clinical study. Uh, and for those scenarios, um, we highly recommend you to submit a uh, pre-submission to have a discussion with uh, the agency. Uh, before you launch your human factors testing. So now you have your testing done, uh, and, and last uh, but not least, uh, you should document uh, your human factors process and human factors testing uh, into a document and include it as a part of your pre-market submission. And to make that uh, process more effectively and consistently, uh, the human factor guidance uh, include a human factor report outline. Um, and we truly believe that uh, this outline uh, follows the order of how the human factors should be incorporated as part of the design and control process. Uh, so in that outline, as we're shown here, you should first talk about the conclusion uh, of your human factor testing, which is uh, the user interface of the subject device supports the intended use, uh, intended user, intended use environment without causing serious harm to the user or patient. Uh, and then you should talk about uh, your intended user, intended use, intended use environment, describe the device interface, um, and document the known use problem, uh, your uh, preliminary analysis, um, the critical task you have identified, and finally, uh, the details of your human factors testing results. Um, it's worth to point out that um, that is, is equally important uh, to discuss uh, the uh, intended user, intended use, intended use environment, as well as describe your user interface, um, because uh, those information are necessary for the agency uh, to review your human factors testing data. So next, uh, we'll um, have Dr. Henny uh to discuss the uh, other drug guidance, uh, which is focusing on when to submit human factors data. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shinfono, and you're all welcome once again. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Henny B. Weil, and it's my duty to walk you through the new drug guidance the contents of the new draft guidance. Well, as you are all aware of, at the beginning of our presentation, in addition to the release of the final human factors guidance on February 3, 2016, FDA issued a new uh, draft guidance document entitled mm -hmm. List of Highest Priority uh, Devices for Human Factors Review. 
And the goal for this new job garden is to set uh, clear expectations and streamline the human factors review process for prima commissions at the agency. And when this uh, uh, new job garden is finalized, uh, it will be co-present the, the, the agency's current thinking on this issue. So I would like to pause here and uh, give a few reminders uh, to your listeners. Uh, as you are aware or may not be aware, the guidance development uh, at agency here is always a collaborative effort between the agency uh, representatives and the other representatives. So, for instance, you as a sponsor, you may be an industry or a device manufacturer. So as part of the agency policy, this guidance is available for 90 days for you to provide your comments or your suggestions. And be reminded that uh, on May 3rd, all your comments must be received on May 3rd, 2016. That is when the 90-day period is at. You also have to be reminded that the official channels have to be used for this, uh, your comment, to communicate your comments or suggestions to us. And uh, the, this guidance has a, a reference document number 1500052. So when you're making a comment to this guidance document, uh, this draft guidance, you have to refer to the document number 1500052. A written or uh, uh, electronic communication will be welcome as well. So as uh, I'm going to walk into the, the, the rest of the presentation, I'm going to walk you through the rest of the presentation, and uh, which is the list of the highest priority devices for human factors uh, review. As you are aware, medical devices are considered one of the safety critical technologies, and the expectation is that human factors validation testing is, is should be part of your robust design control process. And it is our belief at the agency here that uh, appropriate human factors uh, engineer or disability engineering will surely improve the safety and effectiveness of medical devices for effective use. I mean, for intended uses, uses in the use environment. So the question here is not when to do it, but when does it need to be part of your submission? And then the question again is, the question is not when to do it, when does it have to be part of your submission that is part of the, uh, 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 the guidance document that is addresses that. So the next one is, uh, now I'm going to talk about the list of the highest priority devices uh, for, as described in this guidance. As you can see in the, on the list there, uh, this list or these devices were selected because they clearly have a high potential for serious harm resulting from use error. And that information is actually gleaned from medical device report or records. For instance, uh, on the initial issue, uh, issue of this uh, drug guidance or list, uh, genoscopes were not part of the original list. But upon a class two record on September 17, 2015, the, the list was subsequently updated to add these devices on a reprocessing site. So you can see this list is not all inclusive list and most likely will be revised or more lists will be added to, to uh, the general list here. Now, as you can see on a list, uh, I would like to walk you through uh, how this list de de uh, develops. On the list, there's, there's a general device area uh, in a device classification under the CFR regulations. And this is actually followed by an example of a product code. And here I'd like to discuss the product code uh, specific descriptors to identify a group of devices within a, uh, within a class area under the CFR regulations. So for instance, the first on your left hand column, the first rule, which is ablation generators, uh, uh, the product code LPB, OAB, OAB, OH, uh, OCM, were well, product code for devices on ablation generators as the PMA submission. And uh, was OCL was a part 10 case submission. And I'm going to work, let's take a typical example. Uh, on, the, on the left hand side, on the left column, uh, the, the third rule, which is artificial uh, pancreas system. I'm going to use this to post a question and I'll provide a response to that question. That probably will clear a lot of things on this list. So let's take a typical example. What is the artificial pancreas systems on the left hand side on a third row? This system, if your device falls within 
this uh, type of submission, artificial pancreas system, and does not have any of these examples of protocol pro code, OZO, OZP, and OZQ. Does it mean that you have to submit a human factor data for this particular device? The question is, you, the, the, the response to your answer is that you have to, you may want to ask us. So by sending a, a QSAP question to us based on this specification, say that your, your product is a pancreas, uh, it falls under the pancreatic, uh, uh, artificial pancreas system, but does not have any of this product code, then the appropriate feedback will be provided to you for a response. So once again, I would like to emphasize yeah, 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 your comments or suggestions is absolutely necessary and uh, it's very, very extremely important. So please be reminded that your comments must be received on May 3, 2016 as we develop this guidance to go to this one. Now, the list of the group to this one. Now, how, how do you apply this list to your pre market submission? What this guidance does or presents to us, uh, it presents two classes or two criteria generated by this guidance. One is the devices on the list. The other one is the devices not on the list. And on this slide, I would like to talk about, I'm going to talk about the devices on the list. So if your device is on the list, or if your device is clearly on the list, there are two options here. Your first option is that you provide the human factors report and data based on appendix A of the final uh, human factors data. Or the other option is that you have to provide detailed rationale uh, supporting your conclusion that human factors data is not needed. What that means is that you have to conduct a risk, you have to conduct a risk analysis and evaluation associated with the intended uses, uses and in the use environment of your device. And your analysis should indicate that the severity, the, the severity of potential harm resulting from the use error is not serious or it's very minimal. Now, the second one is, I'm gonna talk about the device is not on the list. So if your device is not on the list and your results of a, a, a risk analysis indicate that if users fail to perform a critical task or users fail to perform a task or does not perform a task at all and could or would lead to harm, then you are required to submit the human factors data and a report based on appendix A of our final guidance uh, release. Now, in addition to that, ODE may also determine how human factors may be needed on case-by-case -case basis, based on, and, and, and on the following uh, uh, criteria. One of them is, is, the, is your, your submission type. So with the, with the submission type, what we're describing here is a, a pre-market uh, application or a novel petition, and that is clearly indicating that there's a, a potential for serious harm from a use error, then you have to submit a human factors data for a review, for pre-market review. One of the, another criteria is a user interface modification. If you made a user interface modification or new user interface based on, as a response to satisfy a, a, a special control, then you have to submit the human factors data for a review. One of, another criteria is a, is a, a different users. So if it, your device has, is, is intended for different user, which is different from the uh, predicate intended users, then you have to submit the human factors data for review. Another is if your device is, is, is associated with a use error, and that use error is what led to a recall or adverse events of a medical device report, then you are required to submit the human factors data for review. Finally, and not the least, is the device modification. So if your device is being modified and the modification is related to a user interface being modified, whether it's a simple modification, you have to submit the human factors review or your user tags have been changed or added, you have to submit a human factors review, and then the severity of harm. And finally, if your your device is, is your subject device is for a new use environment, which is different from the predicate device use environment. For instance, if your device, the predicate device was, was used in a hospital and you are, the subject device is supposed to be used in a home, then you have to submit a human factors review for a, a, a pre-market submission.
So I, I would like to conclude by saying that you are highly encouraged to, to actually engage the FDA in your product development as a, an appropriate, uh, so that the appropriate human factors data will be, will be submitted for a pre-market review. And once again, uh, the human factors team would like to thank you very much for your attention and attending this seminar, or this webinar. Thank you. We'll now open the line for questions. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please press star followed by the number one on your touchtone phone. Please unmute your phone and record your first and last name when you are prompted. You'll be announced at your turn. If you're in the queue and then decide to withdraw your question, you can do so by pressing star followed by two. Thank you. And we do have a party waiting with the question. I'll open the line. Sue, your line is open. Yeah, we could not find the slide on the website from the URL. Where, where can we find the slide? Uh, the, the, the webinar slides can be found at www.fda.gov forward slash training forward slash CDRH learn. And you will see them under the specialty topics heading. Okay, what was the last, after training slash what? CDR what? CDRH okay. learn. Does that give you the information you need, ma'am? Um, we're looking. Okay, thank you. We're not finding it. Okay, so can we take the next question and we will figure out how to get you, get you the slides, but we have to move on to the next question. Thank you. Stephen Rosenfeld, your line is open. Thank you. Um, I wanted to know how much of our oh, formative oh, testing oh, results oh. should be referenced in the final validation report, if at all. Okay. Hi, this is Shannon. So with the formative, part of what we're looking at when we're reviewing pre-market submissions and we're looking at the human factors data, Part of what we're looking at is that the information is there to show that uh, the work was done to elicit and identify potential users. And so formative evaluation provides some of that information. Again, we're just looking for the overview, for discussion of, of what may have been learned along the way so that we have a better understanding as we're reviewing the final summative testing, uh, what are those critical tasks and what are the things that could impact those. So, so that's the level of information we're looking for in the formative. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll take a question from Dr. Rajal Balako. Yes, good, af good afternoon. Uh, this is Radu Baleka from Aerofarm Standos in Germany, and we would like to ask a question regarding uh, dry powder inhalers and MDI inhalers. We would like to know uh, from your list what priority classification in this list will have these devices in terms of human factors submission. Thank you. Hi, um, this is Erin Keith. Um, I, I just wanted to stress, um, sorry, I'm the division director in which the human factors team resides in the Office of Device Evaluation. Uh, I want to stress that the, um, the draft guidance document that describes um, the conditions under which we would like to see human factors data addressed in a pre-market submission is just that. It's a draft guidance document, and it's not a requirement at this point. Uh, we look at human, uh, we typically see human factors data in submissions at this point when there is a clear safety issue associated with the user interface with the device. So if you have identified that that would be the case for those devices and those devices that you're talking about are being reviewed by the Center for Devices and Radiological Health and not a different center, then you would um, consider submitting human factors data in, in association with your submission. Uh, I would recommend that you 
discuss the actual submission and the specifics of it with um, the review division, which would receive that submission, and the human factors team to make sure that your protocol would address what would be needed to support your specific application. Okay, thank you very much. Next, we'll move to Laura Storm. Your line is open. Good afternoon, FDA, and thank you for this very informative presentation. I have a question on slide 27. Could you please go back to that slide, please? A moment. Thank you. Um, No, that 47. I'm sorry, 47? Oh, 47. Yes, sorry. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Um, so on the last hash mark, it, it talks about device modification. Could you give me a little bit more information on uh, what the FDA's expectations are for human factor studies based upon device modification, which may be made, you know, uh, post 510K clearance? Um, hi, this is Erin Keith again. Um, I, I just want to again stress that that, that document that um, Dr. Rior was walking everyone through is a draft guidance document, so it's not an expectation automatically uh, for all of those specific trigger points for submitting human factors data as a final policy. What, again, we would be looking at right now would be if with the user interface you observe um, a, a safety issue associated with the way that a person interacts with your device through um, human factors, we would like to see that sort of information in a submission. Um, the modifications is referring to if you are modifying the device user interface, um, we would want you to assess whether or not that device user interface um, change would be one in which human factor testing would, should be reperformed to assess the modification or have you addressed what, why you would expect uh, prior testing to have been done to cover that particular. Okay, great. Thank you. That answered my question. Thank you. Nathan Hogan, you may ask your question. Nathan, do you have your line muted? So oh, sorry. Yes, I had my line muted. Okay, go ahead. Um, I had a question about, um, it came up, it came to mind on slide 31 where it talks about tasks and use scenarios. The last bullet talks about critical tasks that have low frequency of occurrence should be included in the testing. I've um, had a couple of interactions with the ODE in the past where we had extremely rare use errors and the correct method was determined to use expert review to evaluate those extremely rare use errors. And I was wondering if your thinking has changed on this or is that meant to be covered in kind of the catch-all pre-submission meetings comment? Hi, Nathan, this is Shannon. Uh, in, in response to that, there's uh, various types of data that can be generated in these tests. And some of that can be uh, subject or objective data that's viewed through performance. And, and as we're looking at uh, expected use, you can capture information on critical tasks along those ways, and other information can be captured through knowledge tasks. And that's um, about the understanding and the comprehension of specific information within your user interface. And so uh, sometimes I think what you might be referring to as expert use might be uh, something along those lines of knowledge tasks, of, of uh, confirming that the information is, is clear and understandable by the user. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. That makes sense. If you have like an information for safety, risk mitigation that you need to evaluate, that that could be evaluated through a knowledge task where you make sure they understand the 
posted contraindication, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and correct. And the the part of the um, the, the challenge of uh, some of this summative testing is is finding the best way to get at the data that you need, and actually throughout the whole human factors process. And so, so coming up with ways to get that information through simulated use or through knowledge comprehension tasks, um, and that all of that's part of laying out the protocol. And, and uh, it is also another reason uh, that we suggest if, if we can assist with protocol review through pre-submission process, uh, we can provide some feedback on that before the testing is run. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will move on to James Taylor. Uh, hello. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I work with uh, automated external defibrillators. And uh, with regards to the uh, uh, AMI TIR guidance for uh, external defibrillators uh, in human factor studies, uh, what weight or use will the FDA make of the specific TR, TIR guidance uh, from AMI? So, so several devices have uh, special controls, as in uh, guidance documents released specifically for those device types. And, and again, as, as those guidance documents are FDA or FDA recognized, um, those would apply to part of the process of understanding the human factors. But uh, all of those are um, process type standards that provide additional information that fit into the overall human factors process. So that'll be used to inform the process, but not necessarily to, to limit it? Correct, not necessarily to replace it. And again, those are areas where you would want to work with your review division and the human factors um, staff uh, assisting with those reviews um, prior to some of the testing to review some of those methodologies because you may have questions to answer from the human factors process and the use error questions in addition to questions you may need to answer according to any device specific standards or guidance documents that you need to satisfy. Thank you. Our next question comes from Chris Iasevich. One moment, I'll open your line. Now it's open. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, I work for uh, a division of a company that uh, makes software medical devices, and I had a question regarding the timing uh, of um, the human factors studies and data. Uh, typically in design validation, which early in the presentation you emphasized that human factors fell under design validation, uh, that's typically done toward the end when your design has been locked down. But in modern uh, software development is iterative, and some parts of the design are still evolving while other parts have been locked down. Do we have to wait until the end or toward the end uh, to obtain our, our human factors uh, data, or can we do that iteratively uh, in line with the, the rest of our uh, product development methodology? Uh, this is Shim Fong, Human Factors Team, FDA. So as we discussed during the presentation, the, uh, during the summative testing or the human factor validation testing, uh, the final design of the user interface uh, should be used in the validation testing. Um, because uh, we, we need to have uh, enough fidelity between the testing um, setup material and the actual use uh, device on the market. And, and that's why we require you to use a final user interface in your validation testing. Uh, however, I think um, in the uh, human factor report outline, we also uh, mentioned that you can include your preliminary analysis uh, and formative study results in the report. Uh, and we think that's where you should uh, include your iterative testing uh, on different stage of your software development uh, into the report and uh, uh, describe how those study results and preliminary analysis inform you to make certain design decisions and use that in your final summative testing. This is Shannon Host. I just wanted to add one thing. As, as you're looking at our, our requested outline for Human Factors report, a majority of that outline is created through the product development process. So majority of that outline sections two through seven, I believe, yes. 
is is the background information that goes into that summative validation record and it's some some of summative validation testing and so so that is all information that is developed iteratively throughout throughout the development process um, and then it culminates just like uh, your design validation will culminate your, your design product um, in the final validation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next, we have a question from Becky Leibowitz. Your line is open, ma'am. Yes, hi. I just had a question about what prompted the change of terminology from summative testing to validation testing. Good. Okay, it's it's not necessarily a change in terminology. It's it's a, a synonymous term. So so we're trying to um, the terms commonly used in the industry. There's human factors validation. There's human factors summative validation. Usability validation. Usability summative. We, we hear a lot of terms as we review these submissions. What we're, what we're getting at is the crux of is that final evaluation of the user interface uh, in a simulated use type scenario. So so as we're referring to human factors validation or in fact, your summative validation, those are really synonymous terms. Okay, thank you. Robert Stevens, your line is open. Hi there, yes, I have a, a couple questions. So uh, related to one of the questions the gentleman asked earlier, you would say earlier that manufacturers should revalidate in case changes are made to, say, training or the IFU in response to the validation study findings. Uh, previously, it seemed the agency would treat this more on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, whether revalidation would be needed. Can you elaborate on that? And then the second question was, can you comment on when it's appropriate or required to have IRB review for a usability study? Uh, so this is Xun Fang. Uh, for your first question, I think during the uh, presentation as well as in the guidance, we, we do say that um, if you are proposing to have certain design uh, modification, uh, that including uh, types of uh, labeling change or training change, uh, you use that design modification as a risk mitigation measure. Uh, then uh, you need to provide follow-up testing data to demonstrate uh, that proposed risk mitigation measure uh, is effective, uh, as you suggested, uh, as well as not to introduce any new use-related issue. Uh, but I think, in more general speaking, uh, as long as your design modification has direct or indirect impact on the critical task, uh, then you should provide follow-up testing data uh, to demonstrate uh, that um, this design modification, uh, you know, is effective in eliminating or reducing the risk, mm -hmm. as well as not to introduce any new risks. And then I think Erin is will answer your. Um... Mr. Shannon, I just wanted to, to note that there are cases where uh, revalidation may not be necessary. And again, it is somewhat of a case-by-case -case basis, mm -hmm. ju just as uh, evaluating how you would uh, establish effectiveness of that control measure can be case-by-case. Um, -case. If, for example, if you're designing a hazard out, um, and, and you're showing that you're totally eliminating the possibility of of a use error, that may be a case where. Uh, it can be discussed, um, you know, what level of assurance would be needed to show that effectiveness of that risk control measure. So, so I, th I think it is a bit of a case by case. Um, but, but again, the the first thing to think about is, is does that need to be evaluated and tested to show effectiveness? Hi, this is Erin Keith. Um, I just wanted to put this sort of request for this this type of testing and resubmission of information in context in that. Um, you're still going to make decisions about when a resubmission for a specific design change to your device meets the criteria for submission to the S or uh, mm -hmm. reevaluation. And then when that change meets that criteria, uh, one of the things that you want to consider in that is how does that impact your human factors data? And if your human factors data is then impacted, then that should be that that should be addressed in the submission. Um, how you um, either revalidated it or, or, or determined that it didn't need to be invalidated. Okay, thank you. And then for the IRB review question, is when is that appropriate or required for a usability study? I, I, 
the, the IRB question again is is it depends on the studies and the study design. So so that will be again that's a case by case uh, decision as to whether or not your human factors study should be going through an IRB or not. So I don't have a direct answer to that. Again, I would suggest working with your reviewing division to identify if, if there is a need for that for your study type. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Poi. Your line is open. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, I'm looking at slide 30 and 31, and it talks about uh, tasks and use scenarios. So for a medical software company where we have validation tests um, at the end of each software iteration or prior to release, could we get this human factors data from the same validation test that we use to verify and validate the software? I think the, the difficulty um, you may have with that or some of the challenges that, that may be with that is um, being able to compile and show that at, at the end of with your product, final product design uh, that you're testing the final interface mm -hmm. and understanding that um, all of the features uh, may have some interaction when it comes to use of the, of the overall product. Uh, so uh, some of that may end up being more formative with a, a final summative test that looks at the complete uh, user interface, um, but, but I think it, it would depend on your, your design of your, your, your product development and rollout on that. Okay, so it is possible. It's not a strict um, separation between, like, the software development process versus this usability engineering process. Again, at the, at the end of the day, the goal is to show that the final design supports safe and effective use. So. Um, okay. It's, it's a matter um, of how that's demonstrated. Okay. Sorry. I just have one more question. Um, you also state that employees should not serve as test participants and you should have about 15 for each distinct population. Um, how strict is that rule? Because let's say we employ software testers. Um, would they be, could we use them as human factors data um, subjects? Well, uh, this is Shimpo. I'm human factors team at the A. So I, I think um, in, if you look at the human factors report, again, that uh, you have um, a preliminary analysis, formative study, and uh, analysis of known use problem, all those processes in, in a iterative design and development process before your final human factors validation testing. Uh, I think what the guidance uh, is saying is that in your final human factors validation testing, uh, you should avoid using your own employee and use minimum 15 participants uh, per each use group. Um, and, and this is a way to avoid introducing bias into your final human factors testing results. Uh, and during your uh, preliminary analysis or design development process, uh, if you choose to use your uh, own self software tester or your partners uh, into your testing, and I think that's depending on what kind of results uh, and objective you are trying to achieve for those preliminary study. Uh, as long as you know it meets your objective and uh, serves the purpose, and it, this is um, I think it's a case by case discussion. But again, for the final human factors validation testing. Uh, as the guidance says, that you should avoid using your own employees and use minimum 15 participants for each user group. Okay, so then just to confirm, it's a guideline, but not so much a requirement then. Well, I think I think it's, it's the the case where for some validation to uh, use the software testers from the the uh, subject device company. The case for that would be if the end users were the software testers of your subject. So, so um, I see. Okay. at the end of the day, you're showing that the, the final user interface can be used with representative uh, ex your expected users in expected use scenarios. So, so that's where um, even one you need the representative of the users. So, so whether or not those test engineers could represent your actual users, but also um, that that um, that they're using it in a scenario where they're not biased, that they're using it as it would be in the real world. Okay. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Tom, your line is open. Yes, uh, my question is, is there some type of protocol, report, template, or or guideline in terms of what this study is supposed to look like? Hello, uh, once again, this is Dr. Hannity Wheel, and I think that the protocol, the guidance of how your testing should look like is it's as a sticky as thing in, in the guidance, but your your testing as well as the use environment and the design test should represent the, the actual use setting of your of your of your device. So as much as possible, the stability of the testing should be what is in consideration here. It takes into consideration as the representative user, the representative uses the use environment as well as the intended use of your device. So what 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 you have to think in advance how you have to put all this pre, uh, 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 simultaneous interaction with the universe into the environment and then how you implement this in your validation test. Yeah, so I, I see it that it's going to mimic your IFU. So as you're executing through the, the IFU, um, you're going to be making observations um, along the way, and and also picking up other things in terms of how it's being misused. So that's how the protocol, I, I would assume, would look. Can you repeat uh, the question again, please? I mean, your comment again. Again, when you're executing these usability studies, um, is there a specific template in terms of the, the detail that you want to see in the report for the pre-market submission? Yes. Uh, the, the report is outlined in the appendix. Yes. So, okay, so within the appendix, you. there's an outline that goes through uh, some of the detail within the report structure. Again, that's a, a recommendation um, of the report and how that information can be laid out so that it conveys easily to the, the reviewers and, and we can quickly understand uh, your critical tasks and what your focus what your focus was on during the summative testing. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Enba Trum. Mr. Trum? Oh, yes. Uh, at the last slide, I think you mentioned about submitting protocols to the agency for review. Is that for both summative and um, Formative? It's for summative. It's only for summative. Formative uh, 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 protocols is, is, is not, uh, uh, probably is not allowed to be submitted, but because we are only going to basically concentrate on, on uh, your human factors validation testing or disability validation testing. So your, 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 the protocol should concentrate on your, your, your formative human factors validation testing. Okay. Thank you. Um, hi, this is Darren Keith. Um, so the focus of the guidance document itself is um, from a you know from a request perspective from the agency and what we would like to see to support the pre market program is the summative um, information. We we think that the um, formative information is very helpful and useful and but we're not we're not requesting um, and requiring companies to submit it. We would uh, appreciate a summary description of what you did and what you learned from it, but not the detailed protocols or reports. Are you ready for the next question? Sure. Thank you. Susan Needle, your line is open. Hi. Um, thank you for the presentation. It was very good. Uh, quick question. On slide 45, when you're talking about the highest priority device types, I'm curious why there's a distinction on whether or not CDRH is the lead center or not when it comes to um, the devices and having the human factor submission. Hi, this is Eric. Could you repeat your question, please? Yeah, I'm curious um, about the distinction on why for some of the devices it talks about um, depends on whether CDRH is the lead center 
for um, whether or not it's part of the highest priority device types to include it, um, to include human factors as part of the submission. Okay. Is there a reason um, for the distinction? Yes, there is. Um, so uh, there are combination products that are have other centers have the lead review over. Um, those would be things that are um, reviewed in uh, the Center for Biologics or the Center for Drug Research and Evaluation. So uh, this guidance document is a, a CDRH guidance document, so it covers the CDRH-led mission. In the event that you have a product that is a, a combination product that includes, let's say, a drug delivery system, such as pen injector or a jet injector or things like that, uh, those submissions, the lead centers are either CEDAR or CEBER, depending upon whether or not it's about a biologic or a drug. There, um, and those submissions aren't aren't governed by this particular guidance document. We believe that the information contained in it is very helpful and useful for you in the development of your product, but in understanding what the expectations are for the reviewing center and, uh, about what they would like to see in a submission, you should be contacting that specific center and having a dialogue with them regarding what information they need for um, as it relates to human factors testing. There is a draft guidance document out at the moment that the Office of Combination Products has, has um, issued related to human factors or combination products, and I would suggest that you uh, review that and consider commenting on that guidance document um, while it is open. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next party, I could not hear the name, but they said they were from Leva Nova. Uh, hi. This is April. Um, I have a quick question, and it wasn't really covered in the presentation, but I wondered if you had any um, guidance or best practices on how to show traceability of your validation testing um, back to maybe task only or design requirements or user needs. Um, if you could get, give any comments on that. I think this is Shannon Hosty from Human Factors. Mm -hmm. On the traceability side, I think that that is always helpful for understanding, um, especially if you're trying to map out how those use errors and risks and user needs were identified, kind of how they were carried through the process, mitigated, and um, finally tested and validated. That, that is helpful to communicate the message of, of the work that was done, and that can be helpful, um, but it, it's not um, required per se. That we don't mention it in the, in the guidance as such. Um, but, but that is a tool that's commonly used um, to, to enable that work to happen and kind of mm, tie everything together, especially if it's done electronically, to link those things and, and assist you in the product development effort. Um, but, but from the regulatory submission standpoint, um, it, it may or may not be useful depending on the, how complex the product is. Those trace matrices can become quite cumbersome. So um, it's a question of whether it can convey that information or whether it's more of an internal tool. So we don't discuss it in the guidance per se. Thank you. Terry Bogucki, your line is open. Hi. I have um, two questions, um, somewhat related to the, the comment um, that was just made because this wasn't addressed in the guidance, but two things. One is if you're going for over-the-counter labeling, we've got some feedback from the agency that our usability testing would have to incorporate the ability for the participants to like self-select out of the testing, which is really sort of independent of the, the errors and the, you know, the use uh, errors that you could run into. And so I wanted your feedback on that. And then the second question is, if a company is going to offer case support for the initial uses of the device, how, what impact does that have on your interpretation of your usability testing results? So, so I think, uh, so case, could, could you elaborate a little bit on what you mean by case support? Well, for example, if you are, you know, you have a con you, you have a product, you've done the usability testing, but then, you know, you can maybe see some mistakes are being made, but you, when you go to sell the device, when the initial uses are done, say at first five cases, for example, you would have someone there to help guide the physician or whoever 
through the product use. Okay. I think I think what you would need to evaluate at that point is uh, understanding the critical tasks of use, understanding if you're expecting um, – it would somewhat like a training program, right? So if you're expecting that the first five uses are gathered by a, a master user or something like that, um, then then maybe that needs to be built into an understanding of your simulated use scenario. So that might be represented in a, in a training type scenario um, within your your summative testing. So so again, thinking back to um, again, what are the critical tasks? What are the things where an error could be made that could lead to harm? Um, and and trying to effectively implement those within your summative study so that you can get a clear understanding of, of, of how your device supports those issues. So, so you're so it, saying I would, I would model the case support scenario in my usability study? If, if you've identified critical tasks, you may need to consider um, that if, if, you're, if you're identifying the need for that for some reason um, as part of your training program, then you may need to consider to show how that's effective and that at the sixth case, uh, these errors aren't introduced. So, it, again, it all depends on your application, understanding your use scenarios, and understanding those critical tasks um, of use and evaluating based on those. Okay. Thank you. The next question is from Patty okay. Cole. Uh, in a similar vein, yes, thank you. In a similar vein to the question on device modifications, um, what's the agency's current thinking on the applicability of the final guidance document to reprocess devices? So, hi, this is is um, Aaron Keith. So, uh, modifications to reprocess devices, or just reprocess devices in general? Mm -hmm. Reprocess devices in general. So, um, I think that you should consider uh, what the impact is on, on the user interface associated with the reprocessing of the device, and make a determination whether or not uh, it meets it meets the individual criteria associated with reprocessing devices. I think that um, there are some instances where uh, human factors data might be important associated with that to support uh, application, and I think that there could be others where it isn't. And we don't have a specific across-the-board policy related to all these process devices that can, should submit. Um, again, the draft guidance document is open for comment about under which the conditions in which um, human factor data uh, to be considered in a in a in a marketing application, and um, if you have any comments related to that issue, feel free to send them to the docket. Okay, thank you, Jennifer Sai. You may ask your question. Hi, um, can you speak a little more as to what is the threshold for serious? Harm, like what? What is an example of serious harm, and what is an example of a harm that is not serious? Because when I think through things, almost any medical device can cause patient injury of some sort, or or at least it's providing therapy. And if someone can't use it, then the patient's not getting a therapy. So, I guess I'm trying to get a better understanding of that because the process seems very either or right now, either. The device can cause serious harm, and you want a validation study, you want the data submitted in a report, or it seems the alternative is that nothing needs to be submitted to FDA. You don't need to see or ever hear about any of the human factors work that was done in that case. So, like, not even a rationale as to why we aren't submitting anything. So is that is that a correct understanding? So when we're, we're looking at high severity harm, so, so what we're looking at, again, it is subjective because risk management is, is a bit subjective. It, it a lot of times uses the numeric uh, quantification, but it is a bit of a pseudo-quantitative process. It's a qualitative process of understanding risks. And so, so as you're looking at high severity um, harms, we're looking at 
from the standpoint of is the device safe and effective, uh, can a clinical harm be created um, by a misuse or an, an error um, in the use of this device? Uh, if uh, if not being treated could have you know a, high, a harmful clinical outcome, then that that may be something else that that flags that perspective. But again, it, it's looking at the overall risk of the device and understanding. Um, what aspects of that device, where could a misuse or a use error cause uh, cause that clinical harm, that high severity harm? And, and I think some of that is also coming from looking at post-market post -market signal data uh, of your predicate device and similar devices on the market. Uh, what we have learned from the market and use of those devices so far, uh, does it you know, introduce any serious harm and uh, uh, issues to the patient or user. So looking at the postmark signal may also help you determine uh, whether there are serious harm to the patient or user. Okay, thank you. And if um, if we make the determination that this is something that does not cause serious harm, then then it, you don't need to see any other human factors work that we might do on the product. So you, nothing in terms of human factor submission, is that true? Well, I think if you reach that conclusion, uh, our suggestion would be you uh, submit a pre-submission uh, pre -pre uh, QSUB uh, to, um, you know, submit your justification as why you think there is no serious harm associated with your device. Basically, I think at that time you were saying is there is no critical task associated with your device. Uh, and then you can submit that uh, justification for the agency to review. Okay, thank you. Yeah, as we said, this is, this is the criteria for when we are um, maybe requesting human factors data. So, so if there is a a risk consideration, uh, that's where the human factors data would be requested as part of the submission. So again, it's um, whether or not it would come in with the, the package uh, for submission. Hello, this is Hannity, and uh, I would like to add something to what my, my colleague has just talked about. Uh, it's like the concentration on you know, clinical harm. Sometimes it can be a delay of therapy, or, or some of the harm may be a little benign because if a device makes diagnose uh, a, a disease or condition, that is also a harm because it's, it's a that makes diagnose and we have to have a, a data for that. So we have to look at the whole device as uh, a as the total waste management. It's, it's, it's a little bit subjective, but these are some of the things you have to take into consideration. So you don't have to pay attention to, to the clinical harm, but also pay attention to some of the, the, the potential harm that may be, be uh, maybe as a result of uh, Therapy or mixed diagnosis. Okay, thank you. Yeah. As we are approaching the bottom of the hour, this will be our last question, yeah. and it comes from Sue. Sue, your line is open. Did you still have a question? Please check your mute button. We'll move on to Dave Zach for the last question. Yeah, hi. Um, developing a mobile medical app for dose guidance for, for a, a pharmaceutical company and interested in how the uh, human factors and usability guidance would apply uh, in the case of a mobile medical app for uh, smartphones. Um, hi. Aaron Keith. Um, so I would say, one, it depends on whether or not this is a product that's regulated by CDRH or a different center. And again, you would need to um, confirm that it, it's a product that is regulated by CDRH or um, to yeah. in this and uh, to know what the sort of expectations are for the submission. But yeah. um, mobile medical apps would fall into the same kind of categories as every other device. If it is something that um, would be received as meeting one of those proposed criteria in the draft guidance document as having a trigger point 
for requesting human factors data, then we would um, want to understand how human factors data was addressed or, what, or why you came to the conclusion that you didn't need to submit it in that specific application. Okay, fair enough. Um, and just one other uh, one other quick question related to that is the device uh, class, uh, I mean class one through three, all all the same considerations regarding this guidance, or is there some some differentiation there that you would consider? Um, the the differentiation is really along whether or not it's something that um, we would be looking at in pre market versus is exempt from pre market. Uh, if it's if it's something that we see in pre-market, we, we see it because we collectively as a whole perceive the relative risk profile associated with that device as something that um, is higher than those that we don't that we don't request to see through the pre-market program. Um, so the probabilities are a little bit higher that we might have a device user interface with a higher risk device that result in something that would, you might want to see the factors data on, but it's not a guarantee. There could be class three devices that we would say um, that it isn't necessary to support the application, and there could be class two through class one security that. Okay, thank you. And that was our last question as our time is concluded. Thank you. This is Irene I here. We appreciate your participation and thoughtful questions. Today's presentation and transcript will be made available on the CDRH Learn webpage at www.fda.gov forward slash training forward slash CDRH Learn by Friday, February 26th. If you have additional questions about the final guidance document, please use the contact information provided at the end of the slide presentation. As always, we appreciate your feedback. Again, thank you for your participation, and this concludes today's webinar. Thank you for participating. All parties may disconnect at this time.